Ah, the old box in the attic full of tapes trick. I should have seen this one coming. You know, I should probably warn him. I've got to make a call. Hold on, guys. I've, I've, I've got to make a call. I've got to make a call. Pick up the phone, you m Hello. The ball doesn't actually exist. That other professor you were speaking to, he doesn't know what he's talking about. What are you doing? Shut up and listen. The name Bagul doesn't show up in any classifications or scripture. Considering this demon goes after children though, you might say it's more like the Canaanite deity Moloch, who was well documented as receiving child sacrifices. Don't you see? Well, what am I looking at? Look, it's not unusual for horror movies to star a villain who comes from actual demonology. Or at least, some Babylonian deity. Moloch was known as the receiver of children. Bagul is known as an eater. Kind of the same thing, in a way. Did you say eater? Yeah, but Bagul isn't actually featured in any historical text. He just sounds like he could be. I mean, thank heavens he isn't, right? I mean, can you imagine a demon like that, moving through the images of your computer screen? Man, that would be terrible. What if you destroyed them? Huh? If you destroyed the images with a fire, what, what, what would happen then? Well, that seems a bit excessive. You, you sure you're not drinking again? In the, in the stories, if an image was destroyed, then the gateway would be closed and Bagul would no longer have access to this world, right? Hmm. You mean like... some kind of threat protection that blocks intrusive images, ads, pop-ups, and malware? You know, I've got just a thing for you, bro. You ever heard of... NordVPN? I think so. Today's episode is brought to you by NordVPN. A VPN is a virtual private network, a service offered by Nord that will encrypt your internet usage and protect your identity when you're browsing the web. In today's day and age, many of us have personal information stored online, whether this be home addresses, government information, or even our bank details. So why not make sure you're safe with a VPN from Nord? How does it work? Nord will have your IP address hidden and encrypt all the data you send and receive as it gets passed through one of their specially configured remote servers. Any hackers after your data won't be able to access it courtesy of the servers, and all data sent through the server is unreadable to outsiders anyway. That means there's no need to worry about connecting to the Wi-Fi in public spaces, including coffee shops and airports. Sign up now using my exclusive link here, or use the link in the description. Nord also gives you the ability to manipulate your IP address to appear in a completely different country which is great if you're away from home and can't access your favorite shows because of country-specific restrictions. With a simple click, you can assimilate your IP address into another country, allowing you to access the full scope of the internet as it should be. I've enjoyed using Nord's Advanced Threat Protection, a new upgrade to the service that blocks web trackers from discovering your location. You can also download files with peace of mind, knowing that Nord inspects the contents for malware first. Not only does Nord boast a reliable VPN, it now has an impressive cybersecurity tool. Right now, NordVPN is offering a great deal where customers who purchase a two-year plan will get an additional one month absolutely free. Just go to nordvpn.com legends or use the link in the description. Bagul is the main antagonist who appears in the horror movies Sinister and the less favoured Sinister 2. He's one of the more ominous looking villains I've seen in recent times, simply designed and yet equally profound. He appears to take the form of a humanoid male, with dark wet hair and a Slipknot-esque mask. Throughout the movies he's seen scuttling in the shadows, lurking in the backs of photographs, and other times materialising before his victims in an effort to terrify them. Perhaps this is what makes Bagul such a compelling villain, that he barely shows himself throughout the movie, and yet causes such terror, as well as the fact that he's obscure enough to maintain a sense of dark mystery. Even the main character Ellison, played by Ethan Hawke, can't figure him out and appears to remain one step behind Bagul throughout the entire narrative. Who is that? I don't know. That's what I'm hoping to find out. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, true crime writer Ellison Oswald moves into a new home in Pennsylvania with his family. He was once this big shot author who wrote a bestseller known as Kentucky Blood, but after trying to capitalize on this fame with more books, can't seem to achieve the heights of success that he once had. He slips into the realm of irrelevancy, 
can't seem to produce anything that gets attention, can't seem to attain the results he was once getting, some years prior. Heh, <laughs> you and me both pal. So desperate to be in the limelight again, Ellison takes some drastic measures. The house he moves his wife and kids into is a home where a family known as the Stevensons were murdered by hanging. Here Ellison intends to discover the fate of the only member of the family that wasn't hanged and remained missing, a 10 year old girl named Stephanie Stevenson. With his morbid plan in action, Ellison believes he has just what it takes to write another bestseller and retain his former glory. But of course he doesn't, I mean only an idiot with a death wish would move into a house that's bound to be as haunted as this one. One night Ellison finds a box in the attic, of course it's the bloody attic, that contains reels of Super 8 film, each labelled as home movies. When he plays these films, he finds snuff footage of different families being murdered in variously creative ways. Of course, instead of turning all of this over to the police, Ellison believes he stumbled upon a gold mine. It would appear from the films that the Stevensons were not the only family murdered by this elusive assailant, but other families spanning back to the 1960s. As with the case of the Stevensons, the youngest child of each of these families was also mysteriously abducted and seemingly spared from the massacres. With the aid of a deputy so-and-so, Ellison is put into contact with an occult specialist, Professor Jonas, when he notices a mysterious rune symbol in each of the films. It is here that Professor Jonas explains that the symbol relates to an ancient and obscure Babylonian deity known as Bagul, who would murder families and take one of their children to consume slowly in his own netherworld. Of course, neither man really believes that these murders are the work of a pagan god, and instead the work of cults performing initiation rites. Ellison proceeds to spend the rest of the movie being haunted. He is terrorised by ghost-like children, scorpions start showing up in his attic, scary dogs start randomly showing up at his house, his daughter starts talking about the missing Stephanie Stevenson being her new friend, and his son starts doing weird shit like this. <laughs> At one pivotal point, Ellison finds the missing children from the murdered family sat in the attic, watching one of the films. Bagul then shows up in the physical world and stuns Ellison, prompting Ellison to burn the projector and the films and move back home, abandoning his project altogether. When Ellison moves home, he is called by Professor Jonas, who provides some more information on Bagul. He shows him early Christian images that show Bagul as a snake, a scorpion and a dog creatures Ellison had been visited by during his stay in the Stevenson's house. Jonas also reveals that Bagul maintained power through pictures and images, and that he uses these as a gateway into the physical world, where he can inflict pain upon those around him. Attempting to put it all behind him, Ellison ends his call with Jonas, and finds himself up in the attic. There, in his new home, he finds another box of films. The deputy so-and-so then calls Ellison, who has done some digging of his own. He tells Ellison that every deceased family had once lived in the house where the previous killing took place. Essentially, by moving away from the Stevenson's house, Ellison has put himself and his family in the killer's sights and marked himself as the next target. Ellison plays the new films he is left with and sees that it was actually the missing kids who had killed their families, under Bagul's influence of course. Right then, Ellison gets lightheaded and realises he has been poisoned by his daughter, who has also become influenced by Bagul. When Ellison awakens, he, his wife and his son have been bound to the floor, before being hacked away by his now possessed daughter. The film concludes with Bagul collecting Ellison's daughter after the bloody slaughter, and carrying her off into his realm. Bagul is a formidable foe, an entity who our protagonist can't even hope to fully comprehend much less defend himself against. Bagul isn't a typical being that torments his victims in a stereotypical sense. He's not there throwing things around the house, banging doors and windows, or jump scaring the victim every chance he gets. No, Bagul operates from the shadows and like a puppet master, he uses the children he has collected to do his bidding instead. In a way, some might say that Bagul is even shy. He doesn't want to appear in the films that he leaves behind for his victims to find. He hides in the background, makes efforts to distort his image, and seems quite eager to maintain his secrecy. Even when he faces Ellison, 
he appears mostly in the form of animals, almost like he's hiding himself in some essence. But what can we learn about Bagul from the movies? Let's start with the rune symbol that Ellison sees throughout each of the home movies. Professor Jonas states that the rune is not a pentagram. It's not something, he jests, that you would see a Norwegian black metal band paint on the walls in goat's blood. Instead, the symbol seems to be either a representation of Bagul, kind of like his graffiti tag to let people know he was there, or in fact less of a symbol and more of a functional resource. You see, Professor Jonas does reveal that early Christians grew fearful that Bagul was living in his images and that his images were gateways into his realm, which is why most material pertaining to Bagul was destroyed. He states that the ancient church believed Bagul could take possession of those who saw the images and manipulate them into doing dreadful things. Children were especially vulnerable to this sort of manipulation and could even be abducted into the images, as we later see happen to Ellison's daughter. So the symbol in question isn't just a means to identify Bagul, it also serves as a function that facilitates his power, a weapon almost. Historically, this symbol doesn't actually look like anything I could find that pertains to demons or entities of the past. Interestingly though, if we look at Ars Goetia, a classification of demons from the Lesser Key of Solomon, we see 72 demons that each possess a symbol, or seal if you will, of their own, that not only identifies them, but can also be used to exact power of that demon, and utilize them in occult magic. So the concept of a symbol having actual power isn't something that's new to the Sinister movie, it's something that was actually practiced. We can even see this in the use of the Christian cross, thought in some demonologist beliefs to repel demons and establish protection from wicked spirits. The actual design of Bagul's rune does appear to be fictional, likely drawn in a way to emulate Canaanite or Babylonian symbols in an attempt to authenticate its validity. In the same conversation, Professor Jonas shows Ellison sketches of a scorpion, a snake, and a deteriorated fresco featuring a dog. These are all creatures that Ellison at one point or another becomes haunted by in the movie, and as already specified, these appear to be manifestations of Bagul. The creatures he chooses to manifest as, however, may not be entirely random, and do have some relevance when we apply Christian doctrine and Babylonian mythology to it. First of all, many are likely well versed enough to know what the Bible thinks about snakes. The serpent after all was the downfall of man, and since has become a creature associated with deviousness and insincerity. God even curses the snake in Genesis, seemingly changing its physiology so it crawls on its belly, eating dust for the rest of its days. The snake is basically written off as a bad creature, an adversary of God, and a terrible omen to humans who were deceived by it. It makes sense then that Bagul would take the form of a snake, given his nature to lure people into his images, as well as to solidify his affiliation against God. The scorpion is a bit more obscure, but again, from biblical scripture, we can learn a few things that might provide some reason as to why Bagul chooses this creature to manifest as. We see Jesus speak in Luke 10.19 specifically of scorpions, where he states, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. It's interesting that despite not having harmed mankind in the same way the snake had, the scorpion is still bunched in with the snake as being the enemy. Jesus wishes for man to trample on both the snake and the scorpion, almost like he is drawing the lines between us and them. The scorpion therefore becomes a dubious creature too, one that ought to be avoided according to the New Testament, and one that would have likely been welcomed by the likes of Bagul, seeking to insult God by adopting its form. This leaves us with Bagul's third form, the big black dog. Now you'd think that the Bible might have some nice things to say about man's best friend, but actually that's not true at all. In Philippians 3.2, readers are warned to look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. In this example, dogs are thrown in with the evildoers and those who mutilate flesh. And indeed, this might be more true of wild dogs that for obvious reasons were not meant to be trusted. Domesticated dogs are not part of this example, and as the rest of the Bible seems to imply, dogs aren't evil, they're just worth less than humans. Dogs in the Bible are frequently compared to creatures who do not know any better. They're uncivilized compared to us, 
and they don't know right from wrong. They are unruly in this sense, and so once more it makes sense why Bagul adopts the form of a dog, another middle finger if you will, to the early Christian rhetoric, and possibly to God himself. In terms of Babylonian influence, the symbols found here are also quite relevant. The snake for example can be seen in the Mesopotamian creature Mushushu, although it was an amalgamation of creatures, including an eagle and a lion. It was also considered to be a sacred animal of both the deity Marduk, who became the patron god of Babylonia, and the deity Nabu, the god of literacy, who would become one of the most respected gods of the people for his gift of writing and wisdom. The snake therefore was likely considered without the same enmity that early Christians viewed it with, and the snake was possibly even celebrated, as opposed to being shunned. The same can be said of the scorpion when we consider Akkadian texts, perhaps more specifically, the scorpion men. Scorpion men were believed to be hybrids of a man and scorpion, as the name implies, and were first created by the deity Tiamat in order to wage war against the second generation gods. These were tremendously fierce creatures, and considering their creation to fight against gods, it stands to reason that these were certainly revered beings, if not ones that struck fear into all who knew them. Meanwhile, in the Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh, these same scorpion men guard the way to the sun god Shamash, and are responsible for opening the doors for him as he travels out each day to bring sunlight. In the Gilgamesh story, they aim to warn Gilgamesh of venturing too far past the gates, lest he be scorched by Shamash upon his return. Dogs, meanwhile, were considered companions of the gods Gula, a Mesopotamian goddess of medicine, and Inanna, one of the most influential goddesses and a deity who represented love and war. With that in mind, dogs were likely considered esteemed animals by the Mesopotamians, and the rhetoric that dogs were lesser than man was likely not as widely circulated. Whilst we only have the information from Professor Jonas as to who Bagul was, a large chunk of information about him doesn't actually come from the movie, but instead from a promotional poster promoting the sequel. The poster itself appears to be a page that's been ripped from a book and is titled Antiquus Devorantum, or in Latin, something along the lines of the antiquity of devouring. It's made to look like a book that might have actually existed in the past, perhaps a classification like Ars Goetia, or Colin de Plancy's Dictionary Infernal, or Johann Weyer's Pseudomonarchia Daemonum. In actuality, such a book doesn't actually exist, and you can rest assured that the information supplied on this promotional poster doesn't come from a historical account. We can also see Bagul's symbol displayed here, as well as a charming illustration of him. The block of text here is where the meat of the bones is though. We are told, traditionally depicted as an imposing figure in black vestments, brother to Moloch, bloodthirsty and savage, abducts young souls to his underworld to feed from them over time. Then it happened that Bagul's eyes strayed to that which belonged to Moloch, and he so desired to consume the children that he took them in the dark of the night. Moloch saw the betrayal of Bagul and shut his mouth with ash, that he might never again taste flesh. Thus did brother condemn brother for eternity. Indeed, this does line up with the research of Professor Jonas, with Bagul abducting children and feeding on them over time. But here we are given more information pertaining to Bagul's brother, Moloch, which I argue is likely the inspiration for his entire mythos. We are led to believe from this fictional passage that Moloch was Bagul's brother, arguably superior to him, considering the outcome of their relationship. Moloch, who is known in several works to be a devourer of children, appears to have been the one to have set the trend of child consumption, or child sacrifice, or was at least the deity who was the most well known for it. Bagul by comparison is a copycat, a being who grew so greedy and gluttonous that he ended up stealing sacrifices from Moloch in a frenzied effort to satiate his own hunger. When Moloch learned of the theft, the brothers fell out and Moloch would fill Bagul's mouth with ash, which would explain why Bagul doesn't appear to have much of a mouth in the movies, and why he doesn't talk. It's also interesting that Malok takes away his brother's ability to physically eat children, which is why we see Bagul reserved to eating the souls of children instead. In The Salambo by Gustav Flaubert, a historical novel about Carthage from the mid-19th century, Malok is referred to as a god of the Carthaginians, 
who accepted the offerings of children as worship. Flaubert describes the statue of Moloch as being made of iron and that he possessed a pair of outspread wings. His arms were so long that they reached the ground and he had three eyes positioned on his brow. He also maintained the traditional bull's head, as frequently seen in medieval art, and his head was raised as if he meant to go about barking terrible orders. He also explains later in the novel that another statue was brought into the city centre of Carthage, and that it was used in an attempt to calm down a storm that had brought pouring rain. Sacrifices were made before the statue, first grain and animals which were placed inside the statue, but when that didn't silence the rain, children were offered next. This account leads me to believe that Moloch was ranked so highly above Bagul that stealing from Moloch was the only hope Bagul had in acquiring children at all. Nobody was making sacrifices to Bagul after all. No one was erecting statues of him and worshipping him, and no one, as far as the information provided to us in the fictional Antiquis Devorantum, even really acknowledged him. The Bible once again provides us with information of deities that might have come to influence the creation of Bagul, once more pertaining to Moloch, which stems as far back to the days of Solomon. Josiah in the second book of Kings is shown to destroy the temples that Solomon had built in honour of Moloch and other deities, those he had been coerced into worshipping as a result of ignoring God and marrying various pagan women. We also previously see Josiah proceed to destroy the statue in Topheth, in the valley of Ben Hinnom, which was used by the worshippers of Moloch to indeed sacrifice children. We are told Josiah desecrated Topheth, which was in the valley of Ben Hinnom, so no one could use it to sacrifice their son or daughter in the fire to Moloch. It is in Leviticus that we see the most frequent use of Moloch and the most frequent condemnation of him, where he is yet again associated with child sacrifice. We are told in chapter 18 of Leviticus, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Here readers are cautioned against giving their children to Moloch, and that to do so would sully their relationship with God and serve as a great disrespect to him. In conclusion, child sacrifice is probably one of the only things that links Moloch and Bagul, but considering the promotional material, the writers of the movie were keen to milk this comparison and incorporate such a deity as Moloch into the narrative anyway. Moloch is after all the entity that is most synonymous with child sacrifice, and considering the eerie image we have of him and his statues, it makes sense for the writers to utilise him and maybe even set him up in future movies as maybe the big bad brother of Bagul. Going by the promotional material of Sinister 2, Another page from the fictional Antiquis Devorantum shows us more information dedicated to Bagul, as well as other ancient deities that were associated with child sacrifice. On the right here we have Baal, a principal pagan deity that presided over the weather, the rain and the thunder in particular. The worship of Baal was such a prominent thing that it extended not only through the Canaanite territories, but also through the Mediterranean and even parts of Africa. It was commonly believed that Baal was responsible for droughts and for what we might say now were natural disasters, but to the people of the time, most notably the Phoenician colony of Carthage, this was because Baal was displeased with them. Human sacrifices to this deity in an effort to please him were not unheard of, and it is believed that children were sacrificed to Baal in an effort to get back in his good books. On the left here there is a deity known as Tanit. And once again, this was a Carthaginian deity known as the Goddess of War. Whilst not specifically associated with child sacrifice, she was closely worshipped alongside Baal, who sometimes can be seen as her consort or even her husband. For this reason, it's likely that she was guilty by association. Finally, at the bottom right, we have Talaluk, another weather god that presided over the realm of rain, only this time from Aztec mythology. In the same vein as Baal, it seems sacrifices may have also been offered to him in exchange for a desired outcome, whether that be for rain for the soil, sunlight for the crops, or for some personal matter that one may have needed resolving. Despite the abundance of gods that required human sacrifices, I believe Moloch is still the closest entity that can be connected with Bagul. The others appear to have influence over other realms that Bagul does not, such as affecting the weather or instigating war. 
By comparison, Bagul is almost dull compared to the awesome powers shown by the likes of Baal or Talaluk. And he's just as dull when compared to Moloch, whose stick he basically copied. Another idea is that Bagul was inspired by something far more simple, the Boogeyman. For years, parents have told their children about the Boogeyman, and in virtually every culture since the dawn of time, a variation of this child scaring menace exists in one form or another. To the Russians, it's Baba Yaga. To the Spanish, it's El Hombre del Saco. To the Greeks, it was Lamia. Pretty much every parent anywhere in any time period basically thought it was necessary and effective to scare their children straight through the use of some menacing character. It ensured obedience in the child, and it taught them that there was a punishment far worse than their parents could give to be kidnapped and or eaten by a shadowy predator. Bagul doesn't necessarily fit into the same category, because even if the child is well behaved, Bagul will still take them away, because he's a greedy son of a bitch. Just ask his brother. But considering we see him mentioned as Mr. Boogie, at least in some of the children's drawings that flash up on screen during the movie, it leads me to believe that there is some experiential overlap between the two characters. They both target children, they both kidnap them and take them into realms that the child can't necessarily come back from, and they both eat the child, whether it be their physical form or their soul. You might have noticed that I haven't touched upon much from Sinister 2, and honestly, that's because I haven't actually seen it. I suppose I probably should… oh, uh, no well, guess there's no need. Well that's another demon or entity saved from the clutches of Hollywood at least. Let me know who you'd like to see appear here next on Fright Night Friday. And as always, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Say goodbye, Bagul. Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you for your time. Yeah, no worries, man. But seriously, don't forget to like and subscribe.